this is the thing about life insurance. It's leverage. So you're always winning, whether it's your transfer of wealth or if it's your living benefits that you're using in the policy. And it's all about what your strategy is. You're gonna use the money to buy something else that's gonna increase your net worth. It's supposed to be so that you can build the net worth. All right, so we are back with another incredible episode of Rants and Gems. This is Matt Garland, NMLS number 58700, but better known as MG, the mortgage guy. We are live. We are blessed. Thank God for another day. All right, before we get started, we introduce my special guest. Make sure you guys go to Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure you guys download the pod, share it to 30 friends, leave a five-star review. Let's make Rants and Gems the number one real estate podcast in the world. So today we're going to have a different type of conversation. I don't think we've had this conversation on Rants and Gems previously. Um, we're going to talk about life insurance. I know, I know, some of you probably thinking, life insurance, what the hell does it have to do with real estate? But it has a lot to do with real estate because in this episode, we're going to teach you how you can use your life insurance to help you buy real estate and ultimately create more wealth for you and your family. So I'm bringing on one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Uh, my girl, she's actually my life insurance agent too, so you can actually, she's not like one of these internet people who are just out here talking about life insurance and stuff like that. She's actually a licensed agent, and her name is actually Lindsay Smith, the agent, <laughs> on you know all social media platforms. So first of all, throw some gems in the comment for my girl, queens get the money, big queens in the building. Let's go, Lindsay Smith. What's yes, up, Lindsay? Yes, what's up, Matt? You're alive and you're blessed? I'm alive and I'm blessed. I love that introduction. Yes, yes, yeah. Big queens in the building. Queens, queens get the money. Queens get the money. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Queens is in the house, son. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I got hype a little bit right there. I got hype. All right, so first of all, introduce yourself for the audience. Uh, let them know who you are and how long you've been a licensed agent for. Sure. So my name is Lindsay Smith, but better known as Lindsay Smith, the agent. I'm a licensed life insurance agent. I also am a broker and I also own my own agency. And of course, I'm the author of... Okay. Gotta shameless, do the plug. Sh shameless plug. I didn't even <laughs> see the book the sitting plug. over there. Okay. okay. Creating wealth through life insurance. <laughs> okay. So I'm a best-selling author. Facts. And that's who I am. Okay. Okay. I like the shameless oh, plug. Oh, don't right let there. me forget to tell you, I've been in the business 14 years. 14 years. 14 years. Okay, okay, I like Not that. Not new to this. You true to this? True to this. Okay. <laughs> Lindsay, y'all. <laughs> she coming with that big queen's energy earlier. The legacy creator herself. All day. All right, so look, I got a couple questions for you. Let's get straight to the point because I don't want to leave no fluff. Like I said in my intro, there's a lot of people out here on the internet that's talking about life insurance and talking about the plays, but a lot of these folks are not even licensed professionals. And me being a licensed professional, I love to speak to other professionals uh, who happen to just be on the internet and put out content to educate our community because you guys actually transact and you do, you write policies every single day. Real business. Yeah, real business, right? So first of all, let me bring out my, my notes here. Can you explain how life insurance can be used as a financial tool for buying real estate and also building wealth? All right, so the first part of the question mm -hmm. of how to use life insurance to build wealth or to use it as a tool to buy real, to estate. Buy real estate, right? Okay, so first off, if you purchase a policy, all right, let's use, let's use you. Okay. All right, so if we purchase a policy that is- Because I do is, have policies with you. You do have a policy with mm -hmm. me, a few. Couple M's. Yes, okay. definitely. So if you purchase a permanent policy, and that's what I need everybody to know, for you to actually use the policy, use the cash value in the policy, which we're going to get to, it needs to be a permanent policy, not a term policy, a policy that builds cash value. So step one is we're going to purchase a permanent policy. That is going to be either a whole life policy or a universal life policy. Second thing we're going to do is our goal is going to be focused on cash accumulation so that we have access to more cash in the earlier time frame of our policy. So we're going to buy a policy that is going to be structured, focused on cash value. 
Okay. And if we structure this policy properly, which means you need to get a licensed agent that knows what they're doing, if you have an agent that knows what they're doing, they're going to structure this policy properly. So you're now going to focus more on cash value. We can overfund this policy so that we'll have access to more cash immediately. Now, when we go out to purchase our real estate, we now have cash that we can loan from ourselves so that we're able to use it for our down payment, for our home renovations, for if we become in a hardship and we're not able to pay for our home, we can make sure we keep our home. And also, if we do it from a standpoint of purchasing a policy for our young children, we will build money over time so that by the time they're ready to purchase real estate, they will already have what most don't have, which is the money saved to have as a down payment or closing costs or just the liquid amount of money you have to have the three to six months of your mortgage in the bank. Okay, so you said a whole lot right there. I wanna go a little bit deeper, right? First of all, what is cash value when it comes to life insurance? Okay, so cash value is going to be the added bonus to your insurance, okay? It's going to be the part of the policy that grows over time that you're going to be able to borrow from the policy. It is a living benefit in your life insurance policy. Okay, so every time you're making an insurance payment, your cash value builds up. Yes, but really, and this is how it works internally, what's happening is the life insurance policy, if you're with a dividend paying company, is going to be paying dividends to your policy and also interest to the policy. So when you make a payment, your policy is paying for the insurance, but it's also gonna have a portion of that payment that's going into the cash value. Where the money is really being made is when the dividend is declared by the insurance company, whether it's 5% or 6% or whatever percent, like right now, most of the companies are about five and six percent. So that means when they declare that dividend, if you have, say, $10,000 in cash value in your policy and it declares a six percent dividend, you will get a return of six percent on that $10,000 in your policy, which bills you more cash value and in turn will increase your death benefit. So if you die, so this is the twofold in life insurance. Okay. We can use it as a living benefit but it transfers wealth when we die because now it's going to give our family a tax-free death benefit at death, which is actually going to be more than the cash value that's in the policy. Yeah, because the entire policy, let's just say it's a million dollars, but typically on a million dollar policy, how much is the cash value over time? So this is many factors, and so I don't like to fluff this situation because it depends on your age, your health, your rating, all of these different things, when you got it and how long you have it. But let's use an example of a 30-year-old. Mm -hmm. 30-year-old buys a million-dollar policy. I'm going to use myself. At 30, I bought a $1 million policy. It cost me $936 a month. A month, okay. At age 30, okay? And this is a whole life. This is a $1 million whole life. Okay. All right? This is a regular whole life. Now, there are variations of whole lives. Some whole lives are going to build cash value faster because they have shorter pay periods. But this is one that you pay to age 100, okay? So if you're going to pay this $1 million policy for the $936 a month, by the time I'm 85, my cash value is going to estimate to be about $1.7 million. Their cash value. My cash value, which means my death benefit now is almost $3 million. Okay. Okay? So I can actually use that $1.7 million. So the key question people are going to say, well, I got to wait till I'm 85 to use the $1.7? No. Whatever cash value has built up at whatever age you're ready to take some money, you are able to borrow that. So let's just say at age 40, okay? At age 40, which I'm 42 right now, at age 40, I had over $60,000 in cash value in the policy. When I started doing the renovations on my home, which you know about, mm -hmm. I needed to take some additional money out. I took some money from my policy. I loaned $50,000 from my policy, and I'm able to use it for whatever I want to use it for. 
And so that's the living benefit. So it's not that you got to wait till you're 85 to use the money. It's whatever money is available at the time that you want to use it. So in a 12 year time frame, you built up a cash value of $60,000, which down you can you pulled out 50,000 and you was able to rehab your property, mm -hmm. right? Now, when you pull out this money, what are the pros and the cons of doing something like this? Okay, so when you pull out money from a life insurance policy, there is an interest that they're gonna charge you, an annual interest. Right now, the interest rates for most companies is 5%. So if I pull out $50,000, the annual um, interest rate is 50%. But it's not like a bank where you have a structured loan where we have to pay this loan back this year. What's gonna happen is I can decide five years from now, hey, I wanna pay some of the loan back, I wanna pay the interest on it. If you do not pay the interest back, and let's say your policy doesn't have any more cash value in the policy, that can eat the policy up. So you want to try to pay your interest if you can, but if you need a couple of years to pay it, you can. So in this example where I took 50, I actually had 60. Also, while I'm taking this loan, my money is still making compound interest, so it's still actually building. So matter of fact, last year my dividend was 14,000. Mm. Okay? So even though I took 50, I had the 10 I, it also paid me another fourteen thousand dollars, right? So I'm back at twenty four thousand. So ex explain the dividend just for because I want to make sure this doesn't go over nobody's head. Because the okay. purpose of me doing this type of content today is not only to educate people on how to use this. Because a lot of people call it like infinite banking, right? Creating your own bank, use life insurance, and all that other good stuff. But I and also we'll wanna, get into breaking down. That. And we can break that all down too. But I want to be able to people to understand how life insurance really works pros the cons because most people don't have insurance mm -hmm. you know how many times we see people in our hoods die and now it's a gofundme out there fish right fry, go fish fry, fries gun everything right so i want you to be able to break this down for people so they can really understand and then call you to do their policy right so what's this dividend you're speaking about so the dividend is going to be what the insurance company declares to give you for owning a whole life policy. Not all companies give a dividend, let's just be clear. Typically, mutual companies are going to give a dividend. They do not have to. So you want to go with companies that have been given these dividends for 200 years, 150 years consistently, because you can obviously count on them giving you a dividend. Now. The dividend is declared by the insurance company, and that will be what gets paid to your policy each year based on what cash value you have in your policy. The good thing is if you have an insurance policy, a whole life policy, and, and I want you guys to know this, we talked about permanent policies. Universal life policies do not receive dividends. Only whole life policies receive dividends, okay? So breaking down the dividend, it's just the money that you're receiving from the insurance company for owning that whole life policy. And you get this annually? You get it annually. Annually. So you took 50 and you still get a dividend of 14000 Right. Annually. Right. Because the type of company that I'm with is a company where when I take my loan, my dividend is still on my entire cash value. So it's still on the 60000 even though it's really it was only 10000 in there. Okay, so now you able to borrow this fifty thousand. You you charge. You're being charged by the insurance company interest rate annually. Uh, annual interest 5%. rate of five percent. Mm -hmm. So now you basically became your own bank. Absolutely. Basically, so if someone who's watching this, who wanted to kind of do this play to buy real estate, they could have. You did this to rehab, so you could pretty much do anything you would want with the money. That fifty k mm -hmm. could have went to buy another property if you wanted. Mm -hmm. And then now you just paid. Now, how? what's your terms on paying back this money? Okay, so there are no terms because this is your own money. Mm -hmm. So if you pay yourself back, that money is available again, kind of like a line of credit. So if you don't pay the money back, then that 50000 is saying that it's on loan and it's not available for you to use. But the interest will keep accruing. So it's 5% this year. If I don't pay back my interest. I don't have to pay the loan back. I could just pay the interest on it. Okay. 
if I don't pay the interest, then next year they're going to charge me for a loan on that interest, right? So that means, let's do the numbers. Let's just say there's $10,000, right? And a 5% loan on $10,000 is going to be what? Uh, $500. $500, right? So that means the interest is $500 for the year. So if I don't pay the $500, then next year it's going to take a loan out for $500. So now I'm really going to owe. So your balance goes up. Right. So you can elect to not pay anything back to yourself. Mm -hmm. And then that, that monthly, that annual interest accrues every single year and it goes on the back end. Mm -hmm. So how do you, so you have to pay your principal balance. In order for that five percent interest to keep, a, you have to pay. No, at least you the can interest. just pay the interest, and so that way it doesn't. Get it doesn't deferred. accrue. It doesn't get accrued. It doesn't get deferred to the back end of your mortgage. But now, if you want to pay more than the five hundred, then that will go to the principal of paying back of the loan. Exactly. So you have an option. You could literally just go online for most companies and say, "Hey, I want to make a hundred dollar payment towards my loan." Right. You can do it any way you want. That's the great thing about it. So for real estate, which makes it so good is let's say you do a deal and you're doing a flip and everything doesn't go as expected. So you thought this six month deal, it now turns into a year. But guess what? If you took the loan from your insurance policy, it's not like hard money where you got to just keep paying them every single month for this, for the interest. You don't have to, you could wait till your deal is complete. You sold the property and now you could turn about, turn around and pay yourself back. And let's say you didn't make a profit on your deal. Something went wrong. Okay, so then I don't want to pay all of it back now. Maybe I just want to pay back some of what I got. Maybe I just want to pay the interest back. It puts you in a place where you have options. Unlike hard money. Hard money, they need that interest payment. Uh -huh. They need it. <laughs> you can't, you know, fall back from it. So in the life insurance, you control the payback of this loan. So what what if, all right, because I already know what people are going to say on this, right? You had this for 12 years. I want to get some money now, right? Mm -hmm. 12 years it took you to get 60000 on the cash value. What are the ways that you can kind of speed that process up so that way you can increase your cash value faster mm -hmm. so that way you can pull from this money and kind of act as your own bank, so to speak? Okay, so if you're trying to do this in a hurry, and this is the, the problem with, with us, everybody wants things immediately. Absolutely. It's right? the microwave. We want to put it in we, and have a meal. We 60 want seconds. it immediately. So what you can do is there are different types of permanent policies. And some are accumulation based. Some are going to speed up your cash value way faster. So those policies I speak about that have a shorter pay period, like p policies that you only pay into it for 10 years or for 20 years and you're done with paying. These, these policies are going to speed up the growth of your cash value so that you're going to have some money early in the early years, if not in your first year immediately. Now, if you overfund your policy, overfunding meaning that you're going to dump in additional funds to these policies on top of the premium, this money is now going to be available immediately once it goes in and goes through, let's say 30 days later. So if somebody says, hey, Lindsay, I'm looking to borrow from my policy immediately. I want to do flips, but I need the cash now. I have this money. I do have to mention to you, when you put that money in, you're going to have access to less than what you put in, right? That, that I'm, it's, it'll be a lie if I tell you that's not the truth. The truth is, if you if you said, hey, I have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, I want to dump into a policy and I tell you, hey, your premium is fifty thousand dollars a year. We could dump that two fifty in and we can dump it in the next year. But if this year what you want to borrow, you're not going to be able to borrow the two hundred and fifty thousand. They'll probably let you borrow up to about 80 percent of it. But let me tell you the win. The win is that when you're borrowing the money, the money that you're borrowing is gaining compound interest. So when you finally do pay yourself back, that money that you had out that you were using was making money. And the twofold to it is if you die, the death benefit is way higher than your 250. I just did somebody with this scenario. 
their 250 got, and they were older, they were 53. So their 250 got them 3.7 million in death benefit, but that's because they were 53. If they were 25, it might've got them five, six million, right? But the young, you know, the younger you are, the cheaper the cost is. Now, they're able to go in, borrow the money, they're going to use it to purchase a property. Once they finish with their deal, their flip, they're going to pay themselves back, but that money made money while they had it out. Mm -hmm. And if they died, their family got three point seven million. I think that's a win. So wait a minute. I just want to make sure I'm I'm following everything you're saying. So you're okay. saying these people took out, they had a quarter million dollars cash. Yes. Sitting in their bank account and they said, Yo, we're gonna go buy some real estate. So you said, wait, instead of you just going to buy the real estate, dump it into a property, let's put this two fifty, get you this whole life policy. I can get you three point seven million as a death benefit. Mm-hmm. Tax free for ta your family. Tax free for your family. Well, now pay the two fifty into the whole policy. Was that one year worth of payments, or what did that two fifty uh, accumulate to? Because they still gonna have to pay a monthly payment on this. So right? they won't. That include that was their annual. They paid. They took care of the annual with that. The annual premium was only fifty. So since you paid two fifty, two hundred was actually the dump in, and fifty paid the premium, but they paid it annually. So, so honestly, so technically, they basically pay like five years of their payment up front. Right. Basically. Right. Is what you're saying. So whatever your annual payment is, you just dump four or five years up front if you got it. Mm -hmm. They put that in there. And then how long did it take them to be able to now pull that money back out and borrow from themselves? So because they did an annual pay, mm -hmm. they within 30 days, they're able to go back in. He was able to take out 180. Okay. Okay. So he didn't need it just yet, but he has a deal on the table. So when he's ready, he'll be able to pull out 180 if it's within this year. Next, the next year, he was putting in another 250, and he was going to have access to three something. I forget what the exact number is, but let's just call it 350. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but long story short, each year he would have access to more percent. Because in this particular policy that I used, which was an IUL that was accumulation based, this policy has a 10 year surrender charge. So in the 10 years he had from the top year all the way down to the 10th year, he has a surrender charge. So it gets. What, 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 hold on. What the hell is a surrender charge? All right. Surrender charge is a fee that the insurance company is charging you saying, if you take this money out, we're going to charge X amount of dollars. Like a, like a prepayment penalty. Right. Okay. So in this. And how much is that? So it varies. Let's just say, let's just call it and say maybe you can't take out about 10% year one of it, year two, nine, eight, seven. Let's just say it's that. Okay. But that's not the exact numbers, but it, it goes down. It's a, it's a scale. A it's a scale, scale. A sliding scale down where when you get to year 10, you basically could take 100% of the cash value that's available. So this is the thing. Although he was only able to take out 180 he had 237000 available. His account has $237,000 in it. It's just that the part he was able to touch was the 180 because they're holding that to make sure that they could take care of this death benefit. That's what they're doing. Okay? But the benefits of him using it, instead of just using the money out of his bank account that he could have just did to do the deal, his money is making money while it's here. And so each year is going to make money. And this is the thing. Let's say you have a bad year two and you're like, I can't pay my premium. You really don't got to worry about it because you paid 250. So the policy could pay itself next year. But obviously, if you want to build the cash value to the max, you're going to dump in some more money. But maybe next year you don't want to dump in 250 and you dump in 100 because that's how your deals played. You can. So it's a lot of flexibility in this type of policy. Oh, just, it's kind of like, sounds like a, a home equity line of credit slash secured credit card right. on steroids. Like you kind of put your own money in to play with your own money, get your money back. But also on the flip side, like you say, you have the benefit of a death benefit of a couple million dollars. So you basically flipped your 250 to $3.7 million. In this case, God forbid something happens to you during this process because life happens. Because life happens. No one, no one knows what's going to happen. So at least instead of someone out there who's maybe watching this who's not probably running their plays or setting up their financial situation like this, maybe you got 250 300 that you was going to use to invest. Your suggestion is, your strategy is 
put that into this specific type of policy, get the death benefit, couple million dollars, borrow 80% of it right away, use that now 80% to do your flip or do your burr strategy or whatever it is, and then when you burr or you flip, pay yourself back and then take your proceeds and you can keep your proceeds in the chain. So if you made 500,000 and you only took out 180, so now you can go ahead. Pay your 180 pay back. Pay your 180 and back. And keep your money. And then now you can still now take that 320, open up another policy separate of that one, right? Or you could dump it into this one. Okay. Right? Because this one, where I set it up where he can dump in 250 each year for 10 years. Now, if he doesn't want to, he doesn't have to, but this policy itself will allow it. So this is why it's important that you deal with an agent that knows what they're doing and knows how to structure these type of policies because it's all about how you structure it. From the beginning, I have to have an idea of what you would like to put in so that I can say, okay, this policy in a lifetime could hold X amount of dollars, which could generate X amount. And this is the other thing. You start out with a death benefit of 3.7. The way I structure this policy is we level out a death benefit so you get the most cash value, so you're not paying for so much insurance. But later on, it pops, and around 61, the death benefit jumps up to like 4.9 million. Then it goes all the way. By the time he's 85, I think it's at like 6 point something million, almost 7 million. And, and that's what adding no additional lump sums. That's with him just, in this particular policy, that was me showing 250 for year one and a hundred K for the other nine years. Mm. So even if you, what's that? 900 K. That's plus nine, 10, 11. That's 1.5. 1. 1. 1.15. 1. Yeah. So he puts in over a 10 year time frame. He'll put in 1.15 of his own money. But in turn that will flip. God forbid something happens to him. It'll go to a 6.9 million death benefit. You said, yeah, basically shit. And the longer he lives, the higher that grew. Shit. Right. So this is the thing about life insurance. It's leverage, right? It's pennies on a dollar. A lot of people try to go against it. They're like, yeah, but I'm getting less money. Yeah, maybe initially you are. Initially, you're going to get less money than what you're putting in when you're loaning from it. But eventually, the cash value is going to supersede by far the amount of money that you put in the death benefit by far supersedes what you ever put in from the gate. Hmm. So you're always winning, whether it's your transfer of wealth, tax-free, or if it's your living benefits that you're using in the policy. And it's all about what your strategy is. Now, if you're gonna be the person that's gonna get this policy and take out all the money, don't do any real estate, that's not really creating your own bank, that's creating your own fail. <laughs> right. <Gee>, because <laughs> I mean, because in that situation, you're not using it to grow your net worth. The purpose of the, creating your own bank is that you're going to increase your net worth. You're going to use the money to buy something else that's going to increase your net worth. Put that money back, have more money to buy something else that's going to create, whether it's you starting a business, you buying real estate, whatever it is that you're doing, it's supposed to be so that you can build the net worth. If you use it properly. And you're doing it from both sides of the fence. Right. Because now you're taking the capital that you was already going to have anyway, and you're dumping into this policy. You borrow from yourself, got an interest being paid back to yourself. Now you take that, dump it into real estate, create your net worth there. If you buy right, you'll be able to burn out of it, keep that asset, get cash flow. Right. Take your money back out, pay yourself back. Use it again. You, and then borrow it again. And repeat. And when you borrowed again, you got more because it was making you money while, while you brought this asset. Because it's compounding interest while you were in the middle of this deal. So now you leveraging your life insurance, you leveraging the bank's money to get your asset, and you just keep flowing and flowing and flowing. Before you turn up 10 years, you can have probably $20 million worth of insurance and probably definitely over a seven figure eight figure depending on what you buy a real estate portfolio at the same time absolutely and so i also want to say this because some people are watching this and they're saying well i don't have two hundred fifty thousand to dump in okay you can do it at any Let, level all right so let's let's talk to a, a more realistic level okay somebody's watching this right now they got fifty thousand dollars that they intended to use that to invest the money they're relatively healthy let's just say they're 
35 years old, good paying job, they want to get this type of policy. What, what type of numbers are we looking at? Concept is still the same. So I did a, thir he's 30, 30 year old. Mm -hmm. He's dumping in 50,000 for the year. His actual premium is 12,500. So even if you didn't have the 50, the premium itself is 12.5. Okay. But he's putting it in 50, so that's taking care of basically almost three years. Okay. He's going to use this money to renovate a home. Now he lives in Florida, so everything is not as expensive as New York, right? Correct. You could find some deals that's a little bit less, but he's going to use this money same exact way as this other person, and it's going to look the same. He started out with a 1.3 million dollar death benefit. His death benefit grows to be about four million. It's the same thing. Whatever numbers you got, if you got ten thousand to put in for the year, we can do it. We're gonna do it at the level that matches with your numbers. Mm. So you don't have to be somebody rolling in a doll. You don't to use this type of strategy. You don't. But I would. I I want to say this. A lot of people have the mindset that they want the seven the ten the fifteen million dollar policy and they tell me they got the twelve hundred dollar annual premium that does not that's not going to work out like that right now with the twelve hundred dollar premium we still can get you a policy is it going to have five million dollars in cash value no it's not right but it's going to be relative to the money that you're putting in so I want everybody to understand when you're watching these videos on Instagram and they're telling you about you could borrow this 100K and get your car tomorrow, you got to have 100K in your policy. So it can't be the $25,000 policy. And when I say 25000 I mean the death benefit. It can't be a $25,000 death benefit policy and you're looking to have 100K in year two. I had somebody say that to me. They was like, I want to buy a house. I need $200,000 as a down payment. I got a $200 budget. $200 a month budget. <laughs> yeah. So I said, if you find that <laughs> deal, I want to know it. I want to know where I could make two hundred k in one year with a $200 budget. I, you want to join that club? Because I, I, I would love to. I will join that club. So we have to be realistic. This is still finance. And the numbers make sense. It's compounded, right? So you compound something small, it's going to grow, but it's going to be small, way smaller numbers. All right. So what are the tax implications on doing something like this, right? Because when you sell a piece of real estate, you have capital gains, especially if you're doing as from an investment standpoint. So when you're doing a burn, obviously you're doing a cash out refinance. You ain't paying no tax on that money. You can dump in and out, right? But for the house flippers, the people who want to flip houses, how does that work now if you are technically borrowing from your life insurance policy, you're using that to flip a house, and then now you flip and now you have all these gains, and like what happens in that standpoint? So as far as the life insurance part, when you take the loan, it's a loan. So it's no income to you because it's a loan, all right? Um, as far as the money you make on your deal, whatever you got going on with the IRS with how much money you made you know, you report and that has nothing to do with the insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever tax implications you have when you purchase a home and you flip it and you make money, you still have that. OK. But there's no capital gains that you're paying from the compound interest you're making in your insurance policy. So if you essentially in that deal where we talked about that person put in about almost one point two. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and they actually ended up having cash value amounts in the latter future in the millions that money has no capital gains because it's under the rule of the life insurance but be clear if your estate is above the exempt limit then your estate can be taxed and what's the limit so right now it's four million okay it was it was actually no let me not say it's four million i know biden is trying to change it to four million it was like 11.2 or 11.7 per person, right? But if you have... Million. Yeah. And but he's if, trying to lower it. He, to 4 million. Okay. Right? Fuck you gonna do and that matter of fact, I even seen something that he, they were trying to lower it to 3 million, which is really bad. But technically right now... Right now, it's like 11 point... 
whatever, 11.2, something like that, like 11.2. And so if you're married, you can have the 22. Like if your spouse doesn't make the money you do, you can use their side and have 22, 22 million. But if he lowers it to 4 million, it's going to put a lot of us in a really bad spot. Because that means if you own real estate in any place like a New York or California, you know. Yeah, you have four million. You have four million and then all your assets, right? So that can make your estate taxable. And your life insurance is part of your net worth. So, for instance, if you own five million dollars in life insurance and you got a home that's five million and you got some other assets for five million, you're above your limit. Yeah, you're done. You're done. Okay. But for the average individual that doesn't have that situation, it is a non-taxable event. It's a tra- the transfer of wealth of life insurance is tax-free. Your estate tax, if you go above your tax limit, that's something different. So what are some other factors that investors need to take into consideration when trying to use life insurance and kind of being your own bank? Okay. So the key thing that I like to point out is the buy sell agreement. Okay. Okay. What's a buy sell agreement? So a buy sell agreement is an agreement that's going to be written up saying what happens if I die or you die when we have a business together? What happens to our shares? What happens to our beneficiaries? So it's the agreement we put in place. So let's do an example. You and I purchase real estate together. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's say we buy four properties. They're valued at four million dollars okay we get a buy sell agreement where if i die you don't have to go into business with my daughter and if if you die i mean and and you die i don't have to go into business with your kids and your family okay the buy sell agreement would state that you own 50 percent, and i own 50 percent. and when i die the life insurance is going to pick up your 50 percent and pay your beneficiaries out also is going to pay me so that the business is made whole. So the purpose of this is so I'm not going to be in a place where I need to sell the property to give your beneficiaries the the money, right? Because if we own property, it may not be liquid. It may be $4 million tied up into the property. So $2 million is owed to your family when you die. But I may not have $2 million, but we're in business 50-50. So the buy-sell agreement is going to protect the business and allow the business to still thrive by paying the business because I now need to hire somebody to help me because maybe the financial responsibility that you had in the business, I still may need that help. So it's going to save me at that point for any expenses I may have when you die, but it's also going to save me from having to sell these properties to be able to pay your beneficiaries. Interesting. Buy sell agreement. We like buy sell agreements. Right. And and the thing about investors, a lot of people are doing investments these days where they have a partner. You know, a lot of people are doing these group investments where they're going in purchasing buildings and, and houses together. Protect yourself because we don't know what's gonna happen in life. Protect yourself with a buy-sell agreement, fund it with the life insurance, let the life insurance pay for that individual's beneficiaries and let that life insurance pay the business. And that's a one-up for the business Mm -hmm. because you already have the properties. So when that other, not that you're hoping your partner die, but life happens and if your partner passes away, you got more, more money, more capital. What are some type of issues or challenges that can happen or arise while you're trying to put together this buy-sell agreement? So the individuals need to be insurable. So that could be a problem. The age may be different. If you're 60 and I'm 50, the cost for my policy and your policy can be way different. Um, And, of course, depending on how you want to cover this buy-sell agreement, you have the option to cover it through term, which is obviously going to be the cheapest way to cover it. But some people would like to cover it with a permanent policy so that while you guys are alive, you're actually building capital for the business. And you're able to use that capital to purchase more real estate, do your renovations, all different type of things. So using the same as an individual, how we explained earlier in this episode, you're doing the same in your buy-sell agreement with the whole life 
and you paying, you can pay up your policy premiums to increase that cash value. Now in your agreement, you can now kind of like supercharge the business that you have with your partner, basically. Exactly. But you can also have a term and a whole at the same time with your agreements, Absol correct? Absolutely. Do you recommend that? So it really depends on the budget of that business. Because if they have a small budget, then the term is going to be the most affordable option. And if they have a larger budget, then it does make sense to have both because the term may cover the portion that you might not be able to afford in the permanent side. The permanent insurance is way more expensive, almost like 10 times more expensive than a term policy would cost. So you're going to get less death benefit for your money. So if you're trying to cover large numbers, you might have... Uh, majority of it in term and just use, you know, get a, a um, whole life policy or universal life policy in addition to as a capital builder for the business. I like that. I like that. So there's so many different options. There's so many different ways you can do it. But basically the bottom line is everybody should have fucking insurance. Everybody. As soon not, as you're born. And, and don't forget the legacy play of, you know, you had the episode where you talked about the individual um, with the what's the household income? What do you say, fifty k? Fifty thousand, yeah, right, yeah, fifty thousand, and how really it's hard for you to afford a home if you make fifty thousand or less, especially in the big markets, mm -hmm. right? So in that case, why don't we start to look at purchasing life insurance for our children soon as they're born, so that when they're ready to purchase real estate? when they're 21 out of college, if they go to college, or 25 or whatever age they are, they already have a down payment. They already have the liquid cash that they're gonna need to show to get approved by the bank. Because if I make a low income, I may never save $50,000 uh -huh. if I make 50000 That means I'm probably netting $3,000 a month, if that. So with a newborn, because I like that strategy you're saying. So with a newborn, what would, like, uh, on a monthly basis, how much would this cost somebody to insure their baby? So to insure a young child, let's just say somebody won. If we insure a one-year-old, uh, let's say for $100,000, it may cost about $30, $35. It's not bad. Okay? But this will give you a $100,000 whole life policy. This policy can essentially, by the time that baby is 85 years old, leaving money behind to their own kids, this can essentially be leaving a death benefit of upwards five, six hundred thousand dollars from the hundred thousand that you got them when they were young. But the cash value side, around in their, let's say in their maybe 20s, their cash value should be somewhere around 20, 30 thousand, maybe 40 thousand, um, depending on if you overfunded it a little bit. So this is going to give them some seed money to have in their, their bank account when it's time for them to purchase a policy. And, of course, if you make more income, you could get the larger size policy. You could get a 20 pay, pay to 65, all those different types of whole life policies that will supercharge that cash value. And your kid can have way more money. It's up to you and what your budget is. But even if you want to get your child a policy and your budget is low, you could get a $25,000 policy for $14 or $15 a month. It's not bad. It's not bad. Right? Of course, that's not going to have hundreds of thousands. It's of about, yeah, but it's going yeah. to have some money. It's going to have thousands, right, that you may not have had. And, and so we have to stop. That's the other thing. We got to stop looking at what everybody else got and say, hey, I don't want to get insurance because I can't get the million-dollar policy like Matt got. Well, I got to get what I can afford so that I can make sure that I still build something on my level. I don't have to have the million-dollar. I don't need to wait until I can afford the million-dollar policy. I'm going to start with what I can, and, and over on. time, yeah. I'll get more and more policies as I can afford more and more insurance. But I'm not going to not get anything because I'm waiting to copy you. Well, look, this is how I look at it. If you got insurance on your cell phone, you should have insurance on your life. Exactly. So for me, everybody can afford anything they want. It's just where you putting your money towards. Mm -hmm. Are you putting it on brunch on Sundays? <laughs> are you getting dripped out? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to protect your life? But I like the play of... Basically being your own bank. And that's really, if you want to be able to borrow a lot from your cash value, you basically need to have the money. But like you said, you can start at 10000 20000 pay your premiums up.
because in the most part, we're going to use this money anyway to invest or do some foolishness with it. So why not create, leverage. why not leverage it? Life insurance and how you just broke it down to me is just another form of leverage. In the same way you, we use in the bank's money, we use an insurance company's money at the same time. But we have to, the same way we've got to put a down payment for real estate, same way we got to put a down payment on our policies, pay up our policies for a couple years, supercharge. Now, let me ask you this, even for my policies, because I did monthly. Mm -hmm. on my policies. Can I supercharge my policies? Mm -hmm. and, that Absolutely. and would it increase my death, cash value? My cash value and, and your death benefit. And my death benefit? Mm -hmm. So what do I pay? I think with all my policies I have with you, I think I'm paying like, no, for, for the whole life. Mm -hmm. I think I'm you paying pay like, like almost three grand with everything, I think. I think, yeah, like three grand with yeah. everything. But I think with the whole the life. The whole life, I think it's 15. 15, 1600, yeah, something 15, like that. Yeah, 15, 1600 for that one. So what's that, like 18,000, 20,000 a year? Something yeah, like, like that? Yeah, 18, 19,000. So if I wanted to throw 100K into this bad boy, mm -hmm. right? That will... How many years? We've had it for almost three years now. No, nah, I think it's been longer than that. I think this policy has been like almost four years. I know you passed your third year anniversary because I got the alert. So we're in between three and four. So okay. you have back money you can pay. So basically, a policy has a MEC limit. And for everybody to understand what a MEC limit is, that's when the policy becomes an endowment. And if you go above the MEC limit, your policy does become taxable. That's when the insurance company deems it an investment. So we always play right under the investment numbers from the insurance company. Um, and so each year you have a MEC limit that you can put in. But if you haven't put the money in, you get to put it in for all the years. So for three years, we haven't dumped the additional money in. You would be able to pay that, uh, that amount for each year. And once in one lump sum. And one lump sum. Right. And then and automatically it would be it would supercharge your cash value and your death benefit. Now what does happen is when you dump money in like that, they charge you a interest for putting the money in, right? Which I think right now is about six percent, right? Um and so some people will say, Well, why would they charge me an interest? Well, the dividend right now on the particular company that you're with, um, is six percent. So it your dividend actually washes that it washes out. out. It, but then next year you got another six percent on that money. You wasn't gonna have six percent on the money that was sitting in yeah, the bank account. Yeah. So so it's basically you pay the fee one time. And that's it. And it's it a compounds one -time for fee the rest and, of their life. And compounds as long as I'm living. Right. Yeah. So. But I'm then not. also buys you more death benefit. So if you pass, it's way more than what you put in. Mm -hmm. It immediately increases that death benefit. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And makes that money available immediately as well. Yeah, because I can borrow a couple of dollars from it right now, but I wouldn't do it right now because it's like, all right, I don't really need this money. But I like the play that you gave here. It's like, all right, now what if I wanted to start a new policy, mm -hmm. right? Start a new policy because a boy losing weight. So, right, you said we can do something. So all for all my, my, my big bone people, <laughs> right? What's the word you use I said I can do? I can, like, refinance my policy, basically? So, basically, if you And were, get a lower, lower rate once I lose weight. You could get a lower rate. We could re-rate. Re-rate. Yeah, that's what it was. You could re-rate as long as it's been one year. You could re-rate and come back and get a way cheaper quote if you re-rate for a better quote. How, how often can you do a re-rate? Once a year. Once a year. So every year as I'm losing weight, I can say, hey, Lindsay, I need to refinance, basically. Right. <laughs> and but the thing is, is, if it's not drastic, then you're not really going to see the difference in the re-rate, right? So you kind of want to wait till it's a big change. It's a big change. Right. Because they only, what they do when people are re-rating, especially on weight, they're only giving you half of that weight. So let's say somebody loses 100 pounds. They're going to say you lost 50. They're going to say you lost 50 because they assume that the person is going to gain back at least half of that weight. Jesus. So they, it's, you know, they put you in a... They put you in a little bind. A little bind. Yeah, but it's not bad. It's a good option but to have. But if you get a new policy... Then it's off of how it's gonna you It's going to be a new way. But that's what I'm saying. So what... And then they have to go back and change. If it's the same company... They'll go back and change those because your new policy is with that company. They're going to change your rating on all of them. Mm, so you, that's a hack. Yeah, that's a, I like to do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you know what it is? The other one is skewed, right? Yeah, They're looking at you from an yeah, angle. Yeah, it's already, you got preconceived notions on me already. Right, so in this one, it's new, and we're saying this is how much you weigh now. Yeah. 
Okay, I like that. So then I can now start from the beginning, fresh policy, let me dump 150,000, 100,000, borrow 80% of that back right away and just keep building and up And then my, we my would policies. set a policy that allows you to dump that, uh, that size that you want to put in, right? If I know from the beginning the type of money you want or aspire to dump in at times, I'm going to structure it where that policy can fit that amount and it not mech. Right. So let's say you're somebody who your income has dramatically changed from this year to next year. And so now you want to dump this huge amount, but you had a small policy. The smaller policy may not fit that amount without mecking. And because I didn't know that that's the amount of money that you wanted to dump in, I didn't know to structure to fit that size dump in. We may have to get another policy for us to fit those new numbers. Hmm. Now. This is the thing. Mecking is not always a bad thing. Let's say you're a real estate investor and you want to transfer your wealth to your family members and you don't want to pay the taxes on this money. Okay. And you don't care to borrow from the policy. This money is specifically to be passed on. At that point, you can mech the heck out of a policy. Because as long as you don't take any loans, it's not taxable. When it, transfer, when it becomes a death benefit at death, it's life insurance. It's tax-free to your beneficiaries. So let's say you bought 20 properties, Matt, and you're like, you know what? I want to leave for sure these five for my kids, and I don't need this money that I'm making from this policy. So all this money I'm making for, from this policy, whether it's rent roll or whatever, I'm putting it into this policy, overfunding the heck out of this policy beyond the MEC limit. I'm not going to touch this money. I'm going to pass this policy, the beneficiaries are my kids. Now you can transfer that wealth and you're not going to pay any taxes on this money because you never loaned from it. So even though you went above the MEC limit, you dumped in way over what you could you had a small death benefit but because you dumped in so much money it became a large death benefit you get to pass this money on and not have to pay capital gains mm. gem right so it is ways to use the mech um for people who know they don't want to touch the money in that policy it's okay for it to mech lots of gems lots of gems Look, give us one more last gem. One more last gem, because you've been dropping some gems today. <laughs> and I don't want to go over nobody's head, so I want to give it one last gem. We're coming up on time right now. One more last gem that can give the people about, especially the real estate folks, of using life insurance to help them build wealth and build cash flow with those properties. Okay. So what I want to tell you guys is that regardless of the amount of money that you have, we could do the Create Your Own Bank policies but i want you guys to understand you're not going to have a large bank <laughs> if you're going to put small money into it if <laughs> you got to put big money for a big bank bank <laughs> big, big bank, bank big, big, big bank money. take little bank <laughs> yeah exactly so i want everybody to understand that i know on instagram and on all of these different platforms people are telling you that you could put little money and get a big bank that is not how it works. The real is, depending on how much money you put in there, that will determine how large of a bank that you're going to have. All my real estate people, you need to contact. Tell them how to find you. So you can find me on Instagram at Lindsay Smith, the agent, spelt with the A. You could go to my website, lindsaysmiththeagent.com, schedule an appointment with me. Get your life insurance set up for you and your family, and let's create your own bank so you could create a large net worth for yourself. Look, guys, <laughs> we only bring in the heat, hair, rants, and gems. Shout out to Lindsey Smith, the agent. And don't forget to get my book, y'all. Oh, yeah, yeah. If no. y'all really want to know about life insurance, tap in to my book. I break down all the types, the benefits, and all the possibilities that you can use for your business with real estate in this book. 
There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, and my Rashad voice, Lindsay Smith. Thank you for coming <laughs> to the uh, Gala Media Studios thank and you. film Rants and Gems with me. This was a great episode. Make sure y'all drop some gems in the comments for my girl, Lindsay Smith, and make sure y'all go tap in with her. And I highly encourage everybody to use these strategies that she was just teaching here on the show to help you build wealth, build that death, death benefit, because life happens. You never know when it's your time especially if you got a couple dollars with you, instead of just letting it sit in the bank, put it into a policy, you get more of a return by having the money in your, in your policy anyway, and then you can use it like a line of credit, all right? So use life insurance to your advantage to build wealth with real estate. This is Matt Garland, NMLS number 58700, but better known as MG the Mortgage Guy. Peace. Peace.